Hello everyone, I'm Jim Longworth and welcome to another edition of Triad Today. Coming up later on, the infamous roundtable gets together, among other things. We'll tell you if we were surprised about any of the election results, but we'll cover much more than that. Between now and then, though, speaking of covering some interesting topics, we'll tell you about cybersecurity and much more. But first, we start out with a very serious problem, and that is hunger in this area, in this state. Well, it's a serious problem everywhere, just about, but especially right here, we want to talk about that. And a gentleman who is now on the job, and we're glad he is, who is attacking this problem. He's with us right now, and he's been here with us before. Good to see him again. Eric Aft is CEO of Second Harvest Food Bank of Northwest North Carolina. Good to see you again, sir. Good to see you, Jim. Thanks for having us. Um, can you tell me, before we, I have a bunch of questions. We probably won't get time to all of them, but I'm just, uh, we get, there's some confusion sometimes when people hear the word food bank and food pantry. Can you, uh, is that okay to ask you that? What's the difference? It's, it's important because a lot of people think about their local food pantry within their church or a civic organization. And the food bank actually provides a tremendous support to all the organizations that provide food assistance. Matter of fact, almost 75% of the food that all the food pantries in the region provide are actually, that comes from Second Harvest Food Bank. Yeah. And uh, you know that's our job is to make sure that they get nutritious food, produce, and that have a ready supply in hand to assist those that are facing Yeah, hunger. and you guys, and it's, there's a whole distribution system to it where organizations come in and can avail themselves. Right. What, what areas, and you don't have to name all the, the towns, but you cover a pretty vast area because when I mentioned Northwest North Carolina, I mean, do you have a number in your head of how many thousands of people that the organizations are able to help who you help or what? Well, it's a two million area population. It goes from Boone to Burlington, down to Statesville, and up to the Virginia line. So it is is substantial, and almost 350,000 folks in that area uh, are live in poverty. So the number of folks we are able to serve is literally thousands of individuals. And uh, whether that's the more rural towns or the population centers, Greensboro, High Point, of course Winston Salem, uh, you know we are there supporting individuals in need. Why well, is Second Harvest? the work that you guys do, why is it so important to the community? Well, as you mentioned, the challenge of hunger and food insecurity is huge in our region. Matter of fact, one in seven individuals face that challenge and one in five children. So when we talk about trying to support individuals to have a healthy life, to help kids be able to concentrate on school and be successful, we need to respond. And the, the, the challenge is substantial, but that's why we're here to respond. Now, of course, people that know you, uh, and a lot of folks know your name and know that you've been a great community servant throughout this area and, and other capacities, but just stepped into the role at, at Second Harvest in July. In that brief time, have you seen, are things better, worse, about the same in terms of hunger? Well, I think we're making a lot of strides because we're reaching more people through direct food assistance or through our training program, through our Providence Culinary Training Program, kind of some other creative uh, avenues that we're doing some uh, community cupboards, it's direct assistance, as well as kind of get, get, getting people to go look at system change. So whether or not the, the issue has changed, what, I've, uh, what I think is happening is that we're doing a better job of reaching those in need, and over time that will definitely shift. And certainly the, the you guys issue. are helping organizations help meet the need, and I get that, and maybe this isn't an appropriate thing to ask either, but I'm wondering, is there anything that you do to address the root causes of hunger? We do, and you know, there's really the two sides of the coin, the immediate need, as you mentioned, then we do try to go deeper. One of the most well-known pieces are Providence Culinary Training Program. Over 700 individuals have graduated from that program, and a, a high success rate, over 80% of those individuals get a job and stay in a job for at least a year in the culinary area. And the fact is, is that we're training so many people to have a successful career path, it makes a huge difference. And I guess here that we're at the holiday season, as it were, uh, how can folks best help the food bank? I think there's a lot of ways that people can get involved because the fact is that we know that people want to make a difference. It's finding that right avenue. If they want to be part of a food drive, maybe their company or their church or what have you is fantastic. They want to do one themselves. Making donations through hungernwnc.org is fantastic. Again, we can put those dollars to good work. Or if they want to come volunteer at the food bank, all they have to do is reach out to us. I figured you were going to say volunteer too, and, and uh, Eric's already mentioned it, but hungernwnc.org and 7845770 is the main number on screen. Thanks for all you do, and I know we'll probably see you back around January, February, somewhere in there, so keep great. up the good work. Thank you, Jim. All right, Eric. Appreciate it. We'll be right back. After. Uh, back now on Try Today, and uh, time to talk leadership and community service. 
And if I were going to pick out two people who could talk about that and were experts, they'd be two people who are community servants who are also leaders. And right here they are. On my immediate right, and they've all been here before, but I'm glad they came back. Ruth Hyde is executive director, now new title, of the Roberts Center at Crumley Roberts. We're going to find out what that is in a minute. Corey Phillips, assistant director of that fine center. Welcome both of you back to the program. Thanks. Great to be um, here. I'm going to go to Corey in just a second. We'll circle back to the Roberts Center, but since I've just announced your title, what is the Roberts Center? Yes, so the Roberts Center uh, is within Crumley Roberts, a center focused on leadership, education, advancement, and development. And we'll see all of those things happen through our employees and their leadership training, as well as all of our community outreach programs um, and all of our classes that we'll be teaching. All right, so the, is the leadership center we talked about with Hank and some other people, is that sort of folded back under this? And Yes, okay. so all of our programs now uh, internally as well as externally that are focused on advancement or community service and outreach um, from Little Red Jumpsuit Tour all the way through Kid Zone will be housed under okay. the center now. All right, let me go to Corey now. Let's talk about what about some of the upcoming programs uh, that you've got going and why are you excited about them? There's a lot of great things. Actually, right now we are um, coming down to the final weeks of our Greensboro Nonprofit Leadership class, which Hank Heidenreich teaches in the center. Uh, always a lot of energy, and that has actually been so popular that we've grown into Charlotte. So we are currently taking applications in the Charlotte market for nonprofit leaders. These are folks who show potential. Uh, with a nonprofit, they may not have the budget line item to pay for a leadership development class. And so we get to travel to Charlotte under the Robert Center umbrella and present that formula and that curriculum to them. Uh, and then also, as of this past Monday, we've opened up applications for our two scholarships. Uh, there's actually three under each category. Uh, three of them are for high school graduating seniors in the state. And the other three are for any aged individual who is in a two-year program hoping to step forward into a four-year program. And you guys are into everything. And also, of course, we've had when you've been on before, we've talked about things you do for children, and mm -hmm. child safety, that kind of thing. The Kids Zone program is very popular. Uh, what's been one of your favorite moments looking back on that? Because we're talking so much about leadership and everything for sure. adults. I just want to get this plug in for what you do for kids. Yeah, the future leaders, right? So I, I would have to say easily one of my favorite moments is when we're out working with the kid, fitting in with the helmet. You know, it's not just Ruth and myself. We get to partner up with anyone inside of our company, whether it's a frontline employee, our top executives, uh, an attorney. But watching that child realize that this grown-up is pouring into them uh, and, and how their eyes light up, it, hands down, is the highlight of any given day. I just think that's great what you guys are doing. Ruth, um, speaking of leadership, let's go back to that now. You've, you have a class underway now, right? Yes, we do. Now, what's been one of the highlights of the, of the semester for that class so far? Well, uh, one of the biggest highlights for us has probably just been the growth. So we started this class with um, about eight folks uh, two years ago, and now we have a full class of 20 students. Wow. And they're representing um, great organizations across the triad from the Y to a small uh, organization, the Sparrow's Nest, which is um, really driven by just one individual. Do I have to be a, a, an executive level with a nonprofit? Can it be any kind of business or are you sticking to helping nonprofit leaders? Well, currently this particular class and the curriculum and our keynote speakers that we bring in are focused on nonprofit, but the curriculum really is for any leader and right, sure. leadership. So this would be transferable across uh, for-profit organizations as well. I want to go back to Corey before time runs out about the open house. When is it and uh, where is it? And you know, because it's open to the public, right? All right. So tell me about that. So that is being held next Wednesday uh, over the lunch hour in the Crumley Roberts Center, uh, the headquarters there on 2400 Freeman Mill Road. Right. Um, it simply would require a, a quick call to us, and we'll make sure your seat's warm for you when you get upstairs. Okay, and I think we'll have on screen uh, Wednesday, November 14th, and uh, Ruth's uh, email address, I think, will be up there too, rdhyde at crumleyroberts.com. And the main website is up on screen as well, www.crumleyroberts.com. I'll say it again for the radio listening audience, crumleyroberts.com. Attorneys at Law do a great job in helping their clients and a great job with outreach, thanks to these two people. Great to have you here. Thank you very great. much. Thanks. Nice to be here. We'll be right back. I'm going to try it today and I uh, have two very special people with me who work for a very special place that's doing special things for great kids and we're going to meet them right now. She's been here before with us but let's meet her again. Kelly Riley is Assistant Director of Foster Care Licensing for Cross North School and Children's Home. Kelly brought with her a special guest, Angie Hall, who's Adoption Specialist. At Cross North. Welcome, ladies. Thank, Thank you. you. Good to be here. Kelly, we'll start with you and just remind us of what Cross North's mission is for somebody maybe you have not seen one of the segments before. 
Sure. It's about um, helping grow healthy futures for children and their families. So whatever challenges they're facing, if that means they are not able to live together in a family setting, or if they need support in school, or need counseling and support services, Crossnor is there as a sanctuary to help them find hope for the future. Tell me something, Kelly, about the average child in foster care and what the need is here in North Carolina. Sure. That's a tough question. I think um, the idea of an average child, it really is the full range of children that need support through foster homes. So we have children that are newborns all the way up to age 21, um, kids of every race, every cultural background. What I will say is that about two thirds of children are under the age of 10 that are placed in foster care. However, we have the hardest time finding families to, to help care for our kids that are older than 10. Which leads us to, to the last question I have for you and then I'll jump to Angie, which is that you, you have a training class for people that, that might want to be foster parents, yes. right? Yes, we do. What is that about? I mean, what are you helping them with? It's training about the impact of trauma, how the system works, how you can support children in, in developing um, healthy behaviors and, and healing from what they've experienced. It really gives you as much as anything can in terms of preparation for yeah. what it's all about. Well, that's right. Angie, uh, no, I think you sent me an email the other day saying that uh, this month, November, is Adoption Awareness Month. Yes. I mean, there are a lot of these special months that we hear about that are great causes, but mm -hmm. why is this one important? And, What's something that you might want us to know about adoption in general? Well, November is has been designated Awareness Month for several years now, and it serves two purposes. One, to call attention to our adoptive parents who have opened their homes to children in need all across the nation, and also to call attention to how many children are still in foster care that need a supported family. There are right. over 10,000 children in the state of North Carolina alone. 10,000 in North Carolina mm -hmm. in foster care but would like to have sort of a forever family. Absolutely. And they're waiting. Yes. Um, can, can a foster parent, let's say that, that my wife and I are you know, foster parents, can we wake up one morning and say, I'm gonna call Angie and ask her, can we adopt this child? Or because you're in the foster care system and your parents and that's, you're not supposed to, I mean, what's the rule? Well, with our program, we do have the, um, the requirement that our parents be licensed. So as they come in, they meet Kelly and our other uh, licensure folks, they go through the program and then we help them with the transition once they're ready to adopt. Right. And it's a, it's a good program. And we have post-adoption services as well. And we create an excellent bond with our families in the right. community. I just think that, that the work you all do, and I, I want to put you on the spot. We didn't rehearse any of this. Let me ask each of you very quickly before time runs out. Why do you like doing what you do? I love helping families, um, seeing kids, seeing the light come on in their faces. It changes them, doesn't it? It does. Mm -hmm. Angie? Adoption day is fantastic. It's probably the best. I've been doing this for over 20 years, and that, that, is, that is the day that's the most special. And Crossroads is just such a great environment uh, as you're nurturing these kids who are waiting and getting great education and great support and counseling. Anybody hasn't been on campus, should maybe I guess they can call and take a tour if they want. Can they? It's just a mm -hmm. great, you know, great. Oh, you know, they have a farm there and everything. It's just great stuff. Look, before time runs out, let me put this up on screen. For more information, to learn all about this and maybe how you might want to become a foster parent and learn more about adoptions, www.crossnor.org is the website. I'll say it again for the radio listening to audience. www.crossnor.org, and I just appreciate everything you two ladies are doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. We'll be right back. After. Back now on uh, Try Today, and I'll bet you, you or somebody in your family has heard the term hack. Not, not me. My wife calls me a hack, but that's a, that's a whole different thing. But <laughs> hacking, you know, elections being hacked, security being hacked, internet, your websites, your Facebook. What are we going to do about it? I just happen to have a gentleman with me here today who is an expert on cybersecurity. Let's meet him right now. Rice Porter comes to us by way of Massachusetts and New England, a good family man with six kids, and, uh, and he is Chief Information Security Officer for UNCG, my alma mater. Welcome to the show, sir. Thanks very much, Jim. Good to see Thanks you. Thanks for having me. Uh, first of all, explain what you do in terms of cybersecurity, because as everybody at the university knows, they don't claim me as a graduate because I don't know anything about technology. <laughs> but what, what are your responsibilities? What do you do? 
Primarily, uh, me and my team are responsible for making sure that the data and the critical systems that are used to deliver knowledge to the students, as well as support those who do that, uh, stay safe, that they're free from uh, breach by hackers or identity thieves or even natural disasters like hurricanes. Right. Um, anything that could compromise the confidentiality, the integrity, or the availability of that data. And I guess people don't think about it being so important with a university when they hear things on TV like, well, uh, Sony or CBS was hacked, or this industry, or Facebook, but it's important at the university. It's, it's very important. I mean, we have 20,000 undergrad students whose personally identifying information is on a system or on several systems at the university. And so if we don't keep that safe, uh, we're sort of dealing those folks a bad hand at the very early part of their careers. And that's not to mention the you know, almost 3,000 faculty and staff and administration, uh, critical payroll data, all the things that happen in a small town happen at a university. And we don't forget, it, well, it is, you're like a small, your own small town, but at the same time, as, as uh, uh, Chancellor Gilliam talks about, there's a lot of outreach going on. You support vendors and a lot of people around in the area, so that's right. you, know, you got a security issue there. I want to read something very quickly that off of an email that you guys sent me. And you were quoted as saying that cybersecurity isn't a technical problem, it's a human problem. That's right. What it is you, a human What did problem. you mean by that? Well, uh, security starts with people's decisions and, and what they do in terms of deciding whether to protect something, to keep it secret, to keep it safe, and how they go about doing that. Cybersecurity is a human issue, but fortunately there are a lot of technology solutions that help keep things protected, encrypted, things like that. If you can lock your laptop, if you can lock your phone with a password, make it a strong password, things like that. Those are all human decisions that affect the outcome of the security of your data. I was going to ask you, what, what, uh, give me some other tips, because because uh, I want, uh, not that, uh, you know, I still have a flip phone, so you're not going to be able to help me. <laughs> but but for but talk about some of these things. I want to drive the point home of things we can do to protect ourselves and not do stupid things either. Give me an idea, because I know people, you know, say things and put things out there that maybe they shouldn't. But Sure. Ahead. And a lot of these things aren't surprising. They're things you've probably heard before, but, you know, don't make your password very simple and easy to guess. You know, don't make it one, two, three, four, five. Make it a complex password. Don't use the same password for every system. Uh, because if data is breached at a company that you do business with, uh, you mentioned Target or Equifax or one of these companies. Um, your password probably is part of that data breach. And if you're using that same password everywhere, well, that means your password's breached everywhere that you've used it. Yeah. Um, keeping an eye on your, your bank statements, things that uh, hackers and activists might try and attack, making sure that you question any uh, transactions that you don't recognize. Uh, these are basic security principles that are going to go a long way towards helping make sure that you keep your data safe. Uh, let me just, uh, we didn't rehearse this or anything, I was just curious because we've never met until just now, why did you want to go into this kind of career? Uh, you know, I spent a long time, I have 26 years in um, information technology, and I sort of came up with the industry a little bit, and as uh, the industry matured, um, there were certain events, uh, you know, 15, 20 years ago, uh, and I was, at the time, I was in a military contracting position, and um, there were uh, hackers that attacked military systems, and the oh, U.S. Wow. Army responded um, by passing sweeping regulations calling for information security officers at every base, in every, at every command post. And so I was interested because I ran systems, network systems, that were under attack. I saw the attacks coming in, I saw the, the traffic, and I wanted to know how, how to do a better job of protecting our systems. Uh, and so I volunteered. I, I, I kind of stepped up and said, train me to be a network security manager. Train me to be an information security officer. Great. Yep. Well, I just appreciate what you do. Up on screen, let me put a couple things up here. uncg.edu is a website. And then you can also go to itsnews.uncg.edu to get all sorts of information about what's going on around the university and even uh, the topics we were talking about today. But I, I really do, seriously, all joking aside, I, I really appreciate what you do because even for uh, stupid people like me that are <laughs> technologically uh, not advanced, uh, you give good advice, you do a great service to the university and to the whole community that depends on the university, and I appreciate what you do. Thanks very much. You know, really it's a wide approach because we do a lot of research at UNCG too, so it's not just our local community, That's it's right. really the world. We're it's protecting global. the world. Thanks, Bryce. Appreciate it. Thanks, Jim. We'll be right back after this. Back now on Try Today, time for the round table, and on my immediate right, but always the political left, Ogie Overman, the great broadcast journalist, and next to him is Sheriff B.J. Barnes of Guilford County, next to him Keith Granberry, who is founder of Helping Hands Consultants, did a great job getting people registered to vote this year, and we appreciate that. My first question to the panel is going to be, are we surprised by any of the election results? But as we all know by now, uh, that our good friend down the row here on the panel, BJ, was not reelected. And I just want to say, and I know Ogie wants to say something, um, we often run into uh, military veterans and say thanks for your service. We don't always do that for people in law enforcement. But uh, B.J. Uh, was not only a military veteran in the Marines, but he spent 24 years keeping us safe 
as a sheriff in Guilford County, and that deserves somebody saying thank you for your service. And so, thanks. Mm -hmm. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Ogie, quick yeah, comment. Yeah, I want to echo that too, BJ. My friend of 20 years, uh, you said something last night that really hit home, and I want to encourage you to do it. You said, I'm not done. You know, there's other things I can do, I want to do, and I want to encourage you to do that, BJ. You don't have to be the high sheriff or the Republican kingpin or any, all you got to do is be the man of dignity and integrity and goodwill that you are, and you'll do many good deeds from here Great on. Great job. Well, thank you. Mr. Granberry. And just because he's not the sheriff, that doesn't mean he still won't be a kingmaker. That's right. He's someone in this in this community who people look up to. They do look and up to. Admire. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so, uh, Democrat or Republican, he's just a good person. And I, you know, I, I often right disagree, here. I often disagree with BJ, but then I come around to his way of thinking because he carries a gun. Now, <laughs> now the first thing I want to ask is, according to a recent poll, over 60 percent of American parents uh, so, oh, I, I forgot to say, was anybody, anybody want to say anything about a big surprise or anything else in the elections? Anybody want to say something that you were surprised well, quickly? Well, other than B.J. and Schatzman, uh, Trudy Wade went down. Yeah, Don't I know that, but that wasn't, that. were you, or Keith? Little, well, I, I, I wasn't surprised bit. about Schatzman. I, I think I called well, I know. It. Keith, Keith, I yeah, Keith it, said that Schatzman would not make it. But I, I did think that the Florida race, uh, to me, uh, was a little one. surprised. I was surprised, but the, the, those racial robocalls, uh, I have to stop. Yeah. Um, I make a lot of racial robocalls to BJ. And it's, <laughs> it's not pretty. Uh, now, according to a recent poll, over 60% of American parents say they would be upset if their child married someone from another political party. Guys, it's a serious poll. Are you surprised by that? And would you be upset if your child married outside of your political party? Ogie. Well, uh, if, if they were mar married a, like a mainstream, traditional Republican, a small government, low-tax Republican, I'm okay, but if we're going to be a trump party, I, I'd have to disown them and write them out of the will and tell them yeah. to change your name. B.J. No, it actually happened in my family, and we survived it. So, I'm, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so but I mean, you believe the results, though. I mean, yeah. that happens. Sixty percent of the families feel that way, though. Well, I, yeah, but the thing about it is, is these... Uh, these kids today, they're going to do what they want to do. Then when they get a little older, they're going to start realizing they should be Republican. Isn't that right? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not right. <laughs> Keith. Uh, it, it happens all the time. They love who they love. I mean, you look at, uh, it's about power a lot of times. Look at Jared Kushner. He, his whole family's Democrat. He's married to Ivana Trump, who was a Democrat. And, of course. Would you change politics if you married Ivanka? I definitely Never would mind. not. <laughs> Never mind. All right. I Reynolds, would not change. Reynolds, <laughs> Reynolds, Reynolds American now supports the FDA's recommendation that Congress raise the age for purchasing all tobacco products from 18 to 21. Quickly, guys, surprised at that uh, position? Okay. No, they, they, they don't need to be fighting any more lawsuits here. They're making their money overseas anyway. PJ. Yeah. Ogie's exactly right. No more. Keith. don't need to be fighting. We, aren't we starting to deal with marijuana now? I yeah. mean, and now we're talking about fighting tobacco. That's right. Uh, the Trump administration is reportedly going to formally define gender as being the biological sex that you're born with, and that's it. You guys have a problem with that, Ogie. Why do they have to do that? It's just another thing of making you feel less than or excluded or, or different. You know, it's not necessary. Come on. PJ. This is going to surprise you, I suspect, but yeah, you know, we need to just get out of the bedroom yeah. and out of all that thank stuff. You, thank you, you know. BJ. My wife said that to me the other night. <laughs> <laughs> Keith, what? what He's it? quick. He's quick. Keith, go ahead. Uh, I, think, I think that we need to stay out of the bedroom, but I do think that when it comes to sports, uh, there has to be some distinction. Meaning? I mean, if you are transgender and you're trying to you play You should not be one and the should, other play you, in the yeah, same. Yeah, you can't do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, sources say the Vatican is considering letting priests marry. Good idea or bad idea, gentlemen? Okay. They should have done that a century ago. Yeah, it's a great idea. Why exactly. not? Why not? Why not? Get married. Anyway, maybe you can get rid of some of this other stuff yeah, that's going really. on. Yeah, really. Yeah, Keith. I think they should have been married. I think this is, this is one of the problems they have. Uh, with all this other stuff. They should be married. This is crazy. Yeah. Uh, finally, there are six states that allow you to keep your name secret if you win the lottery, but North Carolina is not one of those six states. Guys, um, if you won the lottery, would you want to remain anonymous? Ogie. I think so. You know, they use it as a marketing tool to have the happy person walk out with a big check and everybody thinks, oh, I could be that guy. I need to play the lottery. It's just a marketing thing. Yeah. So... BJ. I want them to keep it secret because if not, all three of you guys be calling me yeah, wanting money. Of course. 
and I do that anyway. <laughs> Keith, what do you think? Well, that's you, why I go down to South Carolina and play, because it's secret. Yeah. I don't want Jim calling me, asking me for more money yeah, for a new know. set. Well, I hope he's the one. That, yeah, I don't know about that. Well, that's, uh, that's all the time we have. But speaking, oh, except for this, speaking of lottery, the $1.6 billion Mega Millions jackpot was won by a man in South Carolina. Asked what he plans to buy with the money. He said, South Carolina. <laughs> Did you like that? Good, Jim. Uh, Very good. I thought that was pretty good. All right, for all of us here on Try Today, I'm Jim Longworth. We'll see you next time.